Hello to you all. I thought we could look at log properties today. We're going to focus on logs today. Um, and I guess I want to say, hey, remember that ln is, in fact, log base e. So we'll be talking about lns as well. And I guess I want to start off with properties. What log properties do you remember? Well, there are a bunch of things we're supposed to remember about logs. Um, first of all, some truisms. Log base b of b. What's that equal to? 1. Okay. Can you prove it? Tell me why. So let's put a question mark here. And remember, scorpion tail. Base, power, answer. B to the question mark equals b. Now this is b to the first, so question mark has to equal 1, because if the bases are the same and the terms are equal, the exponents must also be the same. Okay? So, and I hope you noticed that scorpion tail is the way that we can uh, go from exponentials to logs and back again, um, or at least from logs to exponentials. Base, power, answer. Okay, so what about log base b of 1? Well, I could do the same scorpion tail there if I don't remember. Ideally, you do remember. b raised to what power will be equal to 1? Oh, well, that happens when question mark equals 0. Okay, so we know that this is equal to 0. And then if we have something like log base b of b squared, well, scorpion tail shows me b to the question mark equals b squared, so I know question mark equals 2. 2 is question mark. Um, you know, we... Uh, a couple more of these basics that we're supposed to know. Um, remember also that log base b of 0, not possible, and log base b of a negative is also not possible. And we know that from the graph we talked about in the last video. So let's take a look at our log base b graph for a moment. Remember, it's got the inverse points as the exponential, so it's 1 over b, negative 1, 1, 0, and b, 1, with a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So, how about this graph? I've got 1, 0, I've got b, 1, I have 1 over b, negative 1, and we have this vertical asymptote here. So when I ask about log base b of 1, well, that's when I plug a 1 in for x into the log function. And so the y value there is 0. And also log base b, base b of b, well, that's when I'm plugging in a b for x. And what do I get out? I get out a 1. But we can also see log base b of 0 well, there's a vertical asymptote there. That has no value. That's undefined. And the same thing for any negative numbers we want to plug into this log function. Okay. All right, so back to our properties and understandings about logs. Um, logs and exponentials, we said yesterday, are inverses of each other. So b to the power of log base b these are inverses, cancel each other out, and I get x. Okay. Um, likewise, it, you'll see this probably. e to the power of log base e, these cancel, and we get x. All right. In uh, properties, we've got the properties now. There are three properties. So we've got one, log base b of... Uh, x, y, and log base b of x over y, and log base b of x to the y. 
All right, why don't you take a minute and see if you remember these log properties. We certainly talked about them last year, and I know you talked about them the year before when you were in Algebra 2, so give a moment to think about these. See if you can reconstruct those pieces of knowledge. And come back when you're ready with your answers to check or if you have questions. So this is our product property. Our product property says log base b of x plus log base b of y. Two logs, same base, joined together with addition, can be written as one log with that base and yet multiplication. Okay, that's our product property. And sometimes we'll see it going this way, and we'll call that expanding. But sometimes we'll see this, and we want to go to this, and that's condensing. Okay, so be prepared to either expand logs or condense logs. And we'll be practicing a little bit of that in this video. Next, we have the proportion property. And that's where we can split this up into two logs, joined not with addition, but with subtraction. And finally, we have the power property. And the power property, in the presence of a log, I can bring that power down in front, y log base b of x, okay? Now, I will say that these log properties are kind of important because on the AP multiple choice portion, they often uh, write their answer in most condensed form. So if you've gotten to this point in your problem, you won't see these in the choices, you'll see these. Um, and so you'll want to remember your logs well enough for that. Okay? All right. Um, one other thing, the change of base formula. Um, so this is sometimes helpful uh, in our class. It used to be very helpful for calculators. So with my calculator, if I want to do log base 3 of 5, I've got a log button, I've got an ln button, I don't have a log base 3 button. Now I think under math, if I scroll down, nope, yeah, I thought there was, maybe it's the new calculators, log base button. Um, I don't I seem to have a log base button, huh? Um, and as a result, um, I can't in my calculator do this unless I use the change of base formula. This is much less of a, a need for algebra students or pre-cal students uh, with new calculators, but the older calculators, uh, you definitely need the change of base form. So uh, let's think about this. I don't know what that's equal to, all right? And now, I'm going to get rid of the log by exponentiating. So I'm going to exponentiate with 3. These cancel because 3 to the power of log base 3 are inverses. So I have 5 equals 3 to the question mark. Now, instead of... Uh, now, I need to solve for question mark, but instead of using log base 3, I'm going to take the ln of both sides and use my power rule to bring this down in front. ln of 5 equals question mark, ln of 3. And if I'm solving for question mark and these are attached with multiplication, I need to divide by ln of 3. So let's look at what we've got here. We've got ln of 5 over ln of 3, and that's equal to question mark. And we said this was question mark, so this log base 3 of 5 is ln of 5 over ln of 3. 
Instead of taking the ln here, we could have taken the log here, and as a result, we could see log 5 over log 3. So this is our change of base formula. I can't evaluate this in my old calculator, but if you ask me about ln of 5, close parentheses, divided by ln of 3, close parentheses, I can do that no problem. Um, this change of base formula is also useful uh, for people with older calculators. If I need to graph log base 3 of x, um, I know how to graph that by hand because I see the base and I know the reference points would be 1 3rd, negative 1, 1 0, 3 1, and don't forget x equals 0, the vertical asymptote. But trying to graph this on my calculator, well, again, I don't have the log base button on my calculator, so I would have to type this as log of x divided by log of 3. Or I could do ln of x divided by ln of 3. In fact, if I graph both of these, what should we notice? That's right, there's only one graph because this is in fact equal to ln of x over ln of 3, and that's equal to log, base, uh, log of x over log of 3. So I feel like uh, the change of base uh, has less use for many of us now, though there are some things we'll do in calculus where the change of base formula could be kind of helpful. All right. Uh, let's do a little bit of solving. Um, solving is something that we are expected to be able to do when we take the AP exam. Solving log equations. Okay, so log base 2 of 5x plus 7 equals 5. So remember if you will, that I want to get rid of this log so that I can get into these parentheses and solve for x. What is it that undoes log? What's the inverse of log? That's right, exponential. So I want to create the situation where I exponentiate with the log base on both sides. So our log base is 2, so I'm going to exponentiate this 2. This is the base. Over here I have 2, and that 5 is an exponent now, 2 to the 5th. So I have 32 over here. And over here, 2 to the power of log base 2, those are inverses and undo each other. So I have 5x plus 7. So now we're going to subtract 7 and have 5x equals 25, and we're going to divide by 5 and get x equals 5. Now, don't box your answers. Uh, now, are we done? And I, I like to think you're all saying no. And why is that? Because logs are must check. Right? Anything with a restricted domain is a must check, uh, at the very least. So, uh, maybe we should review our must checks. Okay, so what are our must checks? When we have x's in a denominator, like 1 over x equals 5. When I have an x in the denominator, this is a must check. 2, if I square both sides of an equation. That's also going to be a must-check situation. And three, absolute value equals x stuff. If I have absolute x plus two equals x squared minus four, this is definitely a must-check situation. So those are our three main ones, but we also know that um, in situations where we have restricted domains, like square root, uh, we've got x's in denominator already, or log, 
These are functions with restricted domains, and therefore we always have to must check. So let's plug this answer back in up here. What can't I have here? It, it, I don't really care what number this is. Positive number, negative number, zero, it doesn't matter. It might work, it might not work. What's important is, what's this equal to? What can't I have in this red circle? Remember, when we looked at that graph of log, we noticed a vertical asymptote at zero and all the graph over here in positive land. Nothing negative. So I can't have anything negative in here and this can't be equal to zero. If I plug in a five though, 25 plus seven, 32, no problems, five works. Okay. But do remember, logs are must checks. All right, so why don't you try this one? Log 16 plus 2b equals log b squared minus 4b. Pause the video, give this one a try. Don't forget to must check and come back when you're done or when you have questions. Ooh, so what was the log base here? Um, the log base, this is the common log, so it's log base 10. So I need to exponentiate with 10 on both sides. 16 plus 2b equals b squared minus 4b. And then I'm going to move everything to one side because of this quadratic. I'm going to get b squared minus 6b minus 16 equals 0. OK, so now what? Where can I go from here? Oh. Um, does it factor? Well, yeah, it factors. b minus 8, b plus 2 equals 0. Set each factor equal to 0, so I get b equals 8, and b equals negative 2. Now, many students want to throw this away right away, uh, but maybe not. Let's check. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. 16 plus negative 4 is positive 12. So I have log 12. That's no problem. I can take the log of a, a positive number. What if I put my negative 2 in here? Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. Great. Negative 4 times negative 2 is 8. 4 plus 8 is 12. This works. That's not a problem. It's not a problem to get a negative here. What I can't have is a negative when I plug this value back in. Does 8 work? 64 minus 32 is 32. 16 plus 16 is 32. Yeah, both these solutions work. So these are my solutions. Okay. And remember, if we're writing sentence, we say the solutions are b equals 8 and b equals negative 2. Remember, you need to be writing sentences with all your homework. Okay. So how about this one? What can we do here? 3 equals log base 4 of x plus log base 4 of x minus 12. What can we do here? So I can't do this. This is, this is a big no-no. I can't exponentiate each piece. I can only exponentiate both sides, the entire sides of the equation. So I got two things over here. I need to condense this to one thing. And this is why we need really our log properties, so that I can carry out the condensing so that I can be able to do the exponentiating. So two logs, the base is the same, joined with addition. What, how can I condense those? That's right, that's our product property. So I'm going to have x times x minus 12 equals 3. I could even do log base 4 of x squared minus 12x. Do that distributing equals 3. Now what is it that I'm supposed to do? What will get rid of this log and allow me access to this x stuff? We need to exponentiate with 4. Notice I'm only exponentiating the whole side of the equation by 4. So 4 to the third is 64. 
4 to the power of log base 4, they cancel with x squared minus 12x. It's a quadratic. Oh, God, don't do this. And then say each of them with the real. That's so bad. Uh, but instead, we're going to move that 64 over. And now we're going to factor. And so our factors are minus 16 and plus 4. So we get x values of 16 and negative 4. Do they work? Well, if I plug a 16 in here, no problem. 16 in here, no problem. But if I plug in a negative 4, log base 4 of negative 4. Wah, wah. I can't do the log of a negative number. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, I don't really care what's happening over here because I found one place where plugging in that value didn't work. So that value doesn't work. And I only get one solution here. So there were a lot of things in this problem. One, we had to condense first. Two, we had to remember to exponentiate and exponentiate that becomes a number. And then when we were finished solving, we needed to go back and make sure we must check this one, okay? All right, so what can you do with this? Will you please do this one? I bet you're gonna be okay with this log base 8 of 2 plus log base 8 of 4x squared equals 1. All right. So, hey, can I just exponentiate everywhere? No. No, I can't. I have to, I can only exponentiate the whole side of the equation. So here, two logs joined with addition. Let's use our product rule, log base 8 of what is it we're supposed to do when we see addition? We multiply these things. So we've got 8x squared equals 1. And now I'm going to exponentiate. I mean, I guess you could do scorpion tail if you wanted. Um, but I think exponentiating will A, always work, and B, work more in more instances than scorpion tail will. So while scorpion tail is really great for Algebra 2 students, uh, for us, it's a little less, less useful, and exponentiating is much more useful. 8 to the power of log base 8, those are inverses and cancel. We have 8x squared, 8 to the 1 is 8. I divide both sides by 8, and I get x squared equals 1. And then I take the square root of both sides, and I get x equals plus and minus 1. Don't forget the plus and minus. Now let's plug this back into the original. If I plug in a 1 here, sure, log base 8 of 4 plus log base 8 of 2, no problem there, and negative 1. Do I have a problem with negative 1? Well, negative 1 squared is 1, and 1 times 4 is 4. So no, I don't have a problem. Both of these are my answers. So the solutions are... Don't forget to write a sentence with every problem. Okay, what about this one? Log base 6 of x plus 4 plus log base 6 of x minus 2 equals log base 6 of 4x. Why don't you try this one? We'll do one more after that, and we'll move on to some graphing. Okay, so I have to condense. I see the plus, I see the logs have the same base, and don't worry, what if they're not the same base, Mr. Kukla? Yeah, well, we can't use this property, and therefore we can't solve it, and so we would have to pull out our graphing calculator and solve this graphically. We would type this into y1, we would type this into y2, and we would do second, calculate, intercept. But again, that's only if the base is are not the same, would I do that? Um, here, the bases are the same, and so I can condense this to log base 6 of x squared plus 2x minus 8 when I foil these. Um, that should equal log base 6 of 4x. And now I'm ready to exponentiate on both sides. 6 over here, 6 over here. And so we end up with x squared plus 2x minus 8. 
equals 4x. Let's subtract 4x and get x squared minus 2x minus 8. And this factors as x minus 4 and x plus 2. And so we get x equals 4 and negative 2. All right, do these work? Well, if I plug in the 4, I get 8, no problem. I get 2, no problem. I get 16, no problem. So that one works. But if I plug in the negative 2, positive 2, yeah, no problem. Negative 2, uh-oh, minus 2 minus 2 is negative 4. Can I take the log base 6 of negative 4? Nope, no I can't. So this is not a solution. And so x equals 4 is the only solution. Okay, we have to must check these. All right, last solving one is <coughs> log base 9 of x plus 6 minus log base 9 of x equals log base 9 of 2. You know, a lot of students, what they do is they say, oh, look, all of them have log base 9. I can just strip them off and rewrite that equation. And that's so not correct. So please, don't do that. No, we can only exponentiate the whole side of the equation, and we can't get to that until we condense these two logs joined with subtraction. What are you going to do there? Well, give it a try, and come back when you're done so you can check your work. Okay, welcome back. So, I remember the quotient property allows me to rewrite the left side of the equation as x plus 6 over x equals log base 9 over 2. All right, and now what? Well, now we're going to exponentiate. And those cancel. And I have x plus 6 over x equals 2. Oh, look, something in a denominator. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by that denominator to cancel out the fraction. So we've got x plus 6 equals 2x, or 6 equals x. Now, does 6 work? Right, I've got to check this. Don't check it in the condensed form. You have to check this in the original problem. And log base 9 of 6, that's not negative, that's not 0, so I'm okay with that. And log base 9 of 12, no problem there either. Okay, so remember your must checks, remember condensing when solving log equations. Now, um, what about graphing? Remember, you really need to be comfortable with your graphing in this class. It's one of the reasons we hammered it last year, uh, was so you could start getting comfortable with it and to develop um, some uh, uh, conceptual understanding of the math graphically, so that when you see this, you're thinking in terms of, oh, I wonder when this, the graph of this line intersects the graph of this line. Right? That's what I would like you to be getting to the place of where you could say, oh, look, they do intersect someplace in the second quadrant. You know, thinking about things graphically uh, can really, really be a big help to what's going on, not just in algebra land, but also in our calculus that we'll be starting in the next chapter. Okay, so remind me again what our reference graph is for log base b of x. Why? is log base b of x. We talked about it at the beginning of this video, and we talked about it in the last video. You really need to know this. 1 over b, negative 1, 1, 0, b, 1. And don't forget the vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So there's our reference graph. This is always concave down and increasing. We've got 1 over b, negative 1. We got 1, 0, and we've got B, 1. And yes, you need to label points on your graphs. How dare you think not to? All right. So what I'd like you to do, though, is apply our transformations. So y equals 3 log base 5 of x plus 2. OK, so see if you can graph this comfortably.
So I'm starting off with the reference points. Our base in this problem is 5, so I'm going to have 1 over 5, negative 1, 1, 0, 5, 1. And don't forget, x equals 0 is the vertical asymptote. I'm going to put this here because I see so often when students don't put this here, they leave the vertical asymptote at 0, even though we can see the transformation says, hey, you've got to move this log graph 2 to the left. So I'm going to subtract 2 from all the x's. And I also notice a y transformation here. It's outside of the function attached with multiplication, so I know I have to multiply all the y's by 3. This is an x. I did the x transformation to it, but don't do the y transformation to it. So I have negative 9 fifths, negative 3, negative 2, Sorry, negative 1, 0, and 3, 3. Look to where our vertical asymptote is. It's at x equals negative 2, because we subtracted 2 from all the x's. Okay, so what's this graph going to look like? Well, we know there's a vertical asymptote over here at negative 2. Negative 1, 0 is here, and we have our characteristic concave down and increasing shape. So there's 2, 3. There's negative 9 fifths, negative 3. Now, I, I hope you noticed that I didn't try and put a scale on the axes, and instead I drew in the curve. I did put in this point because I thought it would be easy to locate. I drew the curve through that point and then just labeled the other two points. I think you'll find your graphs look better uh, when you don't try and make a zillion little hash marks uh, which don't have the same uh, distance apart from each other. Okay, so how about this one? y equals 1 half log base 3 of 4x minus 1 plus 7 halves. Okay, you should be able to graph this. We've got two x transformations, two y transformations. Don't forget the order in which you need to do those. Okay, so how did it go? Did you start with the reference points? 1 over 3, negative 1, 1, 0, 3, 1, and x equals 0, the vertical asymptote. Remember with y transformations, we follow PEMDAS, which means we take care of this multiplying before we take care of that adding. And with x transformations inside the function, the inside is opposite land, so we're going to be doing the opposite what we see in the opposite order. So we're going to be using SADMIP in here. All right, so what do I need to do? I need to uh, add 1 to the x's, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. This is an x. I need to add 1 over here. And then I see I'm supposed to multiply the y's by 1 half. This is not a y, so I'm not multiplying it by 1 half. My transition points, then, are going to be uh, 4 thirds, negative one half, two, zero, four, one half. And don't forget x equals one now is our vertical asymptote, but that may change because I see I'm supposed to divide all the x's by four. I see multiplication inside is opposite land, so I need to divide all the x's, including this one, by four. We still have one more y transformation. I need to add 7 halves to all the y's. And so where do we end up? Well, that's 1 third. Uh, that's going to be 6 halves, which is 3. 1 half, 7 halves, or 3 and a half. 1, 4, and x equals 1 fourth is our vertical asymptote. Okay, and you know, it's good to check to make sure this is the smallest x value, this is next largest, this is next largest. I see everything is positive, 
and I see this vertical asymptote. So here's my vertical asymptote at x equals 1 fourth. I draw in my characteristic log shape. Here's 1 third 3. Here's 1 half 7 halves. And here is 1 4. Okay. So what happens if we have to graph this log function? So what are you going to do here? y equals 2 ln of x plus 3. Well, what happens here is first, ooh, two y transformations. So I have to do them in PEMDAS order. But what reference points am I using? Well, remember ln is the same as log base e. So my reference points are 1 over e, negative 1, 1, 0, e, 1. Now, I'm OK graphing with e. Some of you aren't. So you could always use a decimal approximation if you're really desperate. This is 2.718, and 1 divided by e is 0.3679. Um, I don't really like labeling those uh, approximations on the graph. You know, I know here I'm going to multiply the y's by 2. There are no x transformations, so my vertical asymptote is going to stay at 0. So what points do I have now? 1 over e, negative 2, 1, 0, e, 2. And then I come back and I add 3 to all the y's. So now I have 1 over e, 1, 1, 3, and e, 5. And I know you're still really tentative about those, but, you know, really, I just have to draw in that vertical asymptote. All of these values are positive. So I'm just going to draw in my swoopy curve and say, all right, well, here's 1 over e1, and here's 1, 3, and here's e5. Remember, these are really fast graphs, not because we need 100% accuracy, but this is plenty of accuracy for anything we need this graph to do. Okay? So remember when you have to graph ln, these are your reference points. Of course, you could always graph this on your calculator, um, but half the AP exam is without, so we want to make sure that you're comfortable with this. Okay, um, there's one last solving one I want to go back to. It's not solving to get a numerical answer, it's solving for y equals. Um, so ln of x minus 1 minus 2 equals ln of x plus y. So we solve this equation for y. Okay, so we've got ln of x minus 1 minus ln of x minus 2 equals y. Well, I see two logs joined with subtraction, so I need to rewrite this in its condensed form. And there we go. I solved it for y. Now, I am not trying to solve for x, so I'm not going to be moving this over. I needed to get y by itself. Okay? I mean, really, that wasn't such a big deal. It shouldn't be, but sometimes students get stuck on things like that. All right. So the last thing that I wanted to do was uh, to take a look at um, this worksheet. On your assignment calendar, it says that um, uh, assignment 12, I believe it was, said in class there was a worksheet that you would be working on in class. And, uh, well, we don't have any classes to work it into except here and now. So let's take a look here and see what we can do. Okay, the first question says a bar of soap starts out weighing 150 grams. Each of the following cases write a model for quantity of the soap remaining T days uh, if the decrease is. Okay, if the decrease is 10 grams per day, 
10 grams per day. So, you know, if you make a little T chart, and on day zero we're 150, day one would be 140, day two would be 130. Is this exponential? No, it goes down by the same amount each time. And so that's linear. So we need to build a linear model here. Okay, remember, rate of change times the input variable plus the initial amount will write me a linear model every time. So my rate of change is negative 10 times time plus the initial amount. And we want to know the quantity as a function of time. So there's my linear model for part A. Part B says it decreases by 10% per day. So 10% per day, you know, that's exponential. That's using this model, P1 minus R to the T. So our initial amount, 150, 1 minus 0.1 to the T, or 150.9 to the T is Q of T. There's our exponential model, 10% per day we're losing. Not plus, because we're losing the soap. We're not adding to the bar of soap every day. And next, we've got so that half as much remains after 10 days. Well, that's a half-life problem. Q equals 1 half Q sub O when T equals 10. So what was our Q, uh, our, sh uh, what was our shortcut for K in half-life problems? It was ln of a half over time for half-life. So if I start with q equals q sub o e to the kt, I know q sub o is 150, and I know that k is ln of a half over 10. And there we go. There's q of t. We built this model. It would be nifty if these problems went uh, at that speed for you too. But um, don't forget that we're in calculus. And while algebra helps us do calculus, um, you could still probably get out of, get away with a three on the AP exam uh, if you had really weak uh, algebra skills. It's just that, you know, if you have strong algebra skills, uh, you're more likely to get that five. Okay, so next it says here, complete the table, complete the table to the right uh, to show the values of the functions f G and H given the following conditions. F is even. Oh, we talked about this. If F is an even function, remember it has y-axis symmetry. And so I know that this y value and this y value, I if I drew it properly, that at positive one and negative one we have the same y value. That's a that's some a property of even functions. So these y values that we have for these negative numbers, these would be the same y values for the positive versions of those numbers. So this is going to be 1. This is going to be, I'm sorry, same y values. going to be negative 1, positive 2, positive 7. Now we're told that g is an odd function. What was true about odd functions? Odd functions, remember, negative f of negative x equals f of x. So we're plugging in a negative x and negative y. Or in this case, we're thinking about changing the signs on the x's, we'll change the signs on the y's. So instead of positive 27 and negative 3, we'll have negative 27 and positive 3. Instead of positive 8 and negative 2, at positive 2, we'll have negative 8. And instead of 0 at negative 1, We'll have positive 1. Oh, I can't change the sign on it. It must still be 0. All right. And now, finally, they ask us to fill in h of x, which is made by g of x minus f squared. So I have to square f and take it away from g. All right, so what's that going to give me? Um, I've got 27 minus 49. That's negative 22. I've got um, g is 8 minus 4 is 
is 4, uh, g is 0, minus 1 is negative 1, uh, g is 0, negative 2 squared is 4, so 0 minus 4 is negative 4. If I put a lot of zeros in a row here, 0 minus 1 is still negative 1, negative 8 minus 2 squared is 4, I get negative 12, and negative 27 minus 7 squared is 49, I get negative 76. Alright, so that's filling out that chart. Um, AP likes doing stuff like this, uh, and they often throw in, you know, uh, draw this graph of, uh, for the even function f of x, and they give you a table with only positive values on it. And so then students draw, you know, the positive value, but because the, the stem of the problem said, hey, this f of x is even, you're supposed to know that it reflects across the y-axis. So please pay attention to details. Don't rush through this stuff. Think about what you're doing. Okay, and no, I don't need sentence for a table. Exponentially decaying substance, weighed every hour. We've got some values here. Uh, time since 9 a.m. Then determine half of it. Okay, so we have to build a model and figure out when we would have half of the amount. Well, I'm going to say that t equals 0 is 9 a.m. because we're going since so this is my initial amount. So q equals 10 e to the third t. Now, I need to find this k. I've got lots of ordered pairs to work with. I'm going to plug in this ordered pair, not 10, but it's time since 9 a.m. So I'm plugging in a 1, comma, 8.9. So that goes over there, and the 1 goes over here. I'll have 8. 10 e to the 1 goes in here for t. So I'll divide both sides by 10. And then I'm going to have to take the ln of both sides. So the ln of 0.898 will be my k. ln of 0.8958. And so I get that I guess I want to put it here, kind of run out of space, it's still a little like this. So we have this, q equals 10 e to the k of t, and now we have a value for k, right? It's e raised to the negative 0 0.1100381052 t. Don't wrap that. Don't round until the end of the problem. Unless you want to get the problem wrong, don't be that lazy person. Okay, so there's part A. Part B says, then determine the half-life of the substance. Half-life. Well, we know half-life is a uh, time. And if I'm supposed to determine the half-life, I want to know t equals when q equals half of the original amount. So my original amount is 10, half my original amount would be 5. Okay. Divide both sides by 10, I get 1 half equals e to the minus 0 0.1100381053t. You know, and the amount of time you complain about that decimal. Um, you could have written the problem over again. Take the ln of both sides, and then we can bring this down with the power rule and divide by our k value. So ln of a half over our k value, negative 0 0.1100381052, will tell us what t is. So ln of a half divided by negative 0.1100381052. And I get e equals six point nine is when we round to three places. Two nine nine. And do we have units here? Hours. 
um, after an encoder. Okay, so um, we have half the original amount at t equals. So don't forget to write that sentence. Okay, there's just a couple more problems here. Next one for the size of a bacteria colony doubles in eight hours. So I know that 2q sub o equals q when t equals 8. Okay, so that's we're going to have twice the original amount. That's what we have. That's the original amount. We're going to have twice the original amount when t equals 8. Okay, so what do I have here? How long will it take for the, uh, the bacteria to be five times its original amount? Huh, well, so they don't seem to have given me an original amount to work with. Is that a problem? No. Look, you're going to start with this, and you're going to now plug this in. Okay, and so we've got 2q sub o equals q sub o e to the k times 8. Now I divide both sides by q sub o and take the ln of both sides and get 8k equals ln of 2 and so k equals ln of 2 over 8. Now I plug this back into my model 2 equals q sub o e to the ln of 2 over 8t. But Mr. Goog, I still don't have the original amount. I agree, but hold on, we don't need it. What's the question asking us? How long will it take us to have, how long will it take us to have five times the original amount? Q, what we have, should be five times the original amount. So I'm just gonna plug five Q sub O in here. and divide by q sub o. Did I need to know the original amount? No. Not based on the way this problem is written. I'm going to exponentiate both sides. I'm sorry. I'm going to take the ln of both sides. That was strange. Take the ln of both sides and use the power rule to bring down this expression. So I've got ln of 5 equals ln of 2 over 8t. And if I multiply both sides by the reciprocal 8 over ln of 2, 8 over ln of 2, we see that t equals 8 ln of 5 over ln of 2, or an approximation of that number, ln of 5 divided by um, Don't use that eight. I get one eight point five seven five. And are these hours? Uh, yes, hours. Uh, so it will take eight point five seven five hours to get five times as many as we started with. Please make sure you write a sentence. Okay, really, it's not hard to write a sentence. Don't be that lazy person. Oh, I saw a lazy person like that this year. They ended up with a three on their AP exam. They could have gotten a five if they just weren't pig-headed. I mean, they fought for their lazy. Don't fight for your lazy. Okay, now, what about this last one? The spread of measles at the school, ooh, this could be like the spread of COVID at the school, 200 over 1 plus e to the 5.3 minus t, where t is the number of days students were originally exposed to infected students. Okay, do you know what this model is? Do you know what it looks like when you graph it? So let's see if we can do some of these problems, and then let's take a look at this is an important curve in math, but it's a very important curve in our life these days. So the first question says, 
estimate the whole number of the initial whole number of students. So we want to know when t equals zero, what's p equal to? And we want it rounded to the nearest whole student. So I'm going to plug a zero in here for this t, and that's going to give me 201 plus e. 5.3 minus zero is 5.3. Don't forget when you put this into your calculator, everything in the denominator has to be in parentheses. So I'm going to have 200 divided by parentheses 1 plus e to the 5.3. Do I need two parentheses there? Yes, those two parentheses. And I end up with 0.993. I'm rounding to the nearest person, and so uh, initially there were, uh, there was one infected student. Okay, part B, what is the maximum number of students who could get measles? Well, so when I think about maximum, uh, that is going to happen sometime in the future. And so I want to think about putting in a big number here. Okay, um, So what would happen if we plugged in a big number there? Like instead of t equals zero, we put in t equals a billion. So now we've got up here in the exponent 5.3 minus a billion. Well, it's not going to be negative a billion, but it's going to be pretty close. And e raised to the negative a billion power is 1 over e to that not quite billion power. You've got one pizza and e to the billion power people come for dinner. What's that going to be? Yeah, that's going to be you get no pizza. So this part here turns into 0. 1 plus 0 is 1. 200 divided by 1 is 200. Now, we're not exactly 200, but if we're rounding to the nearest whole person, 199.999 is going to be 200 people. So using some analysis, I can figure out that um, the maximum number of students is 200. Now, I also know that with logistic functions, that this number on top is always the maximum. That's always the carrying capacity of the environment. Okay. All right, what's next? Um, part C, estimate the number of days it will take for 100 and stu 150 students to be infected. 150 students. Well, 200, 1 plus e to the 5.3 minus t. They're asking me to solve for t when the number of students infected is 150. Now, I can do this algebraically by multiplying both sides by that denominator. I'm not going to distribute now. I'm going to divide both sides by 150. So when I divide both sides by 150, I end up with 4 thirds. Okay, that gets rid of these. Now I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides, e to the 5.3 minus t equals 4 thirds minus 1, or 3 thirds, gives me 1 third. Now what am I supposed to do? Well now I take the ln of both sides, and I get 5.3 minus t equals ln of 1 third, or t equals 5.3 minus ln of 1 third. Okay. Pull out our graphing calculator and do 5.3 minus ln of 1 third. And I end up with t equals 6.3986 or 6.399. And are these days? Yes. Days. It will take us a little over six days before 150 of the 200 students are infected. Okay, and then the last question here 
says, when will the rate of the spread of measles be a maximum? And what is that rate? Well, when is the rate a max? That's the same as saying, because remember we said uh, last year and this year that uh, rate of change is slope with units. So that's like saying when is the slope most positive. Well, let's take a look at this graph. Now we know that the y values go up to 200, and we can't have a negative number of kids. Oops. So I'm going to go from 0 to 200 on my y's. Negative time isn't much use either. Um, we knew that after six and some days, 150 kids were infected, so maybe 10 is enough here. We might need to go to 12 or 15. All right, and let's go over to y equals and type in this logistic function. 200 divided by, remember, everything in the denominator has to be in parentheses, e to the 5.3 minus x, close that parenthesis, close that parenthesis, uh, and I think we're good to go. Graph. Do I see it? Yeah, I get a pretty good sense of it here. Let's make this window a little more x. So I'm going to go out to 20 in steps of 2. Okay, so this is a typical logistic function. Um, and logistic functions are really powerful tools uh, for modeling. Um, I know that we spent a lot of time in pre-cal modeling, say, population with exponential curves. Um, population of the city starts off here and over time grows. Um, and that, that's generally accurate for a while. But what's the implication of using uh, PERT for this kind of situation of population? Well, this is time, this is population. As time heads to infinity, what happens to P? Where's P? It's going up to infinity as well. So can you imagine a situation where you could have an infinite amount of population? Like you've got a kitchen sponge and it's got some bacteria on it and the bacteria multiply and spread on that sponge. But can you have an infinite amount of bacteria on that sponge? Can we have an infinite number of people on the planet Earth? Or an infinite number of bighorn sheep in our, our uh, Catalinas or Rincons? And the answer is no. So while an exponential might be good early on, what we really need to consider is a logistic function. Logistic function starts off like that exponential but then it gets to this point here and it flips, continues to grow forever. It's an ever increasing curve, but the population growth slows down as time goes by as the population reaches the maximum carrying capacity of the environment. And we call this Y equals L. Uh, L is the carrying capacity of the environment. Our problem, the carrying capacity, the maximum number is 200. Okay, This was our initial amount. At time equal to zero, one student was infected. And now the question is asking you, hey, when is the rate at which this, uh, these measles are spreading? When is the rate a maximum? And when is the rate a maximum? we said is, when is the slope most positive? And curiously, it's right here. This inflection point where the graph goes from increasing concave up to increasing concave down, this is always the place where the rate is a maximum. Okay? Now, I can also tell you that if this is y equals L, that the y value here will always be L over 2. And so what I could do is I could, um, with, with uh, 
by hand, I could say, okay, I don't know when this is, but I know that that population will be 100 kids are infected. So if I set my population model equal to 100, I could solve this equation for t. Or I could come up here and I could graph a line y equals 100. And I could say, hey, let's do second, calculate, intersect. One, two, three. And I get that the time would be 5.3. Oh, isn't that interesting? All right. So this is our inflection point, and we've now answered the question, when will the rate of the spread of measles be a maximum? Here, at 5.3 days, the rate at which people are being infected is, uh, is the, the, the greatest. And let's think about the units uh, we have here. These are days. These are kids infected. And when we think about the rate, we're thinking about a slope. And so I've got a change in Ys. That's a change in kids infected over a change in days. Okay, so it's going to be kids infected per day will be our rate. Now, in order to find the slope, because it does say here, what is that rate? I need to find the slope at this point. How do I find the slope at a point? Well, you know, until this class, we might have said I can't find the slope at a point. Um, right now, what I can do is I can find the slope at that point. No, I can approximate the slope at that point by using a point that's wicked close to this point. I mean wicked close, like this is the original point, and now I want to use 5.3, oh, 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 one. Now, I don't know what the y value is here, so I'm going to go over to my table. And I'm going to type in 5.3, oh, 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 one. And see what I get. And it looks here like 100, but if I arrow over onto it, I see that it's not actually 100. It's 100.123456755. Okay, so now with two ordered pairs, I can use the slope formula. M equals, or I'm going to say that the rate is approximately... 100.0000005 minus 100 over 5.3234567.1 minus 5.3. Okay, well, let's see what we got. Don't forget, everything on top is in parentheses, everything on the bottom is in parentheses. So I've got 100.1234567. 5 minus 100 divided by 5.3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, minus 5.3. And I end up with 50. So the slope here is 50. And what were the units? It's kids infected per day. So we can approximate the rate of change here. We can approximate the slope here. The slope is approximately 50. 50 kids per day infected. That's the greatest rate. Here, it's less than 50 kids a day. Here, less than 50 kids a day. But we do know that the greatest rate is there. All right. So we covered two things in this. One, an in-class worksheet. I did it for you. And two, 
we took a look at uh, reviewing log properties and graphs of logs and solving log equations. All right, I'll see you in our next video where we wrap up uh, logs and exponentials, um, I think. Uh, tonight's homework, boy, I can't find any of my pieces of paper right now on my desk. Tonight's homework is a worksheet. No, yes, no, that was 14, tomorrow night's. Tonight is this bookwork. Ooh, and it looks pretty short. Uh, bookwork tonight, worksheet tomorrow, and I'm going to go look for what assignment 15 is so I can make a video of it. All right, take care, everybody. I'll see you in the next one.